Okay, I think we can slowly make a start. So hello everybody again. Uh, my name is Jo van Herrigan and I'm one of the Centre of Educational Neuroscience members. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the SEN seminar series and to welcome Professor Pirjo Onjo, who's our today's speaker. So um, Pirjo Onjo works as a professor at the uh, University of Helsinki uh, in special education. Um, she's also at the moment a visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg and an associate editor for learning and individual differences. And she's also on a number of other um, boards of different journals and grant foundations, uh, etc. Her uh, research mainly focuses on the development and learning of mathematical skills, uh, learning difficulties in mathematics, uh, and a lot of her research focuses on uh, evidence-based assessments and uh, intervention tools. And today she is here to talk to us about understanding and supporting children with low early numeracy performance, how to avoid learning difficulties later on. So period, thank you very much for giving this talk and I'll uh, give the floor to you, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for having the possibility to come here and, and present our research group's uh, work. Um, it's a, uh, I'm not very used to this kind of Zoom world where I cannot see anybody. So it feels like I'm in a in an elevator alone and talking this talk. But maybe you are there and maybe you are listening. And I'm, I I try to be short in a way that you can have your questions and we can discuss issues. I think that's uh, most fantastic. Uh, moments in, in academia life when you can discuss research with, with colleagues. So I hope we have time for that. Uh, first of all, I as, thank you, Joe, for a nice introduction. Um, I come from the uh, University of Helsinki and I'm, I'm leading the active numeracy research group at the moment here. And uh, one thing that is uh, kind of nice to know I'm not going to, to tell you what I have done during the last 20 years, uh, but uh, maybe uh, because I want to share the newest results of our studies, so that's why I'm not going into deep details of the history, but uh, my mindset or my way of working and how our, our, work, our group is working is, is this kind of a very special educational viewpoint to, to learning and learning difficulties. So first of all, we, we try to understand the developmental dynamics in mathematical learning. And it's essential to kind of understand what are the differences in that those dynamics uh, between the individuals to be able to understand why learning difficulties occur and why low performance occur. Uh, and then uh, and second point or balloon in my, my mindset is the assessment tools. I, I'm fascinated of developing good tools for teachers to identify children who have learning difficulties. I think it's essential, essential part of special education to be able to, uh, to, to, to identify children in a proper way and reliable ways. And, and at, in most of the countries, educators are the key persons there. And I think that the researchers uh, work or, or aim is to, to give them good tools to do their work properly. And from assessment comes intervention. So if we find children who have difficulties in their learning, we have to be able to support them. Uh, I, I hate the idea that we assess kids without doing anything. So in my mind, it is it's highly important to be already ready when we start assessments, assessing children's skills to think that what do we do to support them in their le learning if they have problems. And from there, of course, we, we have new knowledge from interventions, which will affect our, our understanding of developmental dynamics. So it's kind of a circle that I keep on going uh, in my career, and, and but it kind of helps me to, to put pieces together uh, and, and kind of think different ways in different situations. And um, what I think um, kind of 
separates uh, special educational researchers from, for example, psychological orientated researchers is this kind of applied side of our work that we work so that the educational practice would be uh, better. So it's more, more emphasized in our work than, for example, some, some others disciplines. So I, I, that's why I'm still fascinated with the special education uh, as a field of science. Uh, then uh, when, when I'm talking about learning difficulties and, and low performance, it's also good to know that I'm talking about that 20% of the, of the proper population, student population or children's population, because I include there the dyscalculia kids, which are, let's say, 5 to 8% of the population. Also those that are low performing, so meaning 15 to 20% of the population. So for me, those are, are on, on, on the focus of our research. We distinguish sometimes the group, so to be more severely problems with learning. And sometimes we put them all together depending on the research design. But basically we are worried and we want to kind of support the kids who have low performance. Uh, which often leads to later uh, learning difficulties. And as you know, the, the more we go to the dyscalculia side in this spectrum, the more intensive and specified and time is needed for educational support. So this is also good to know that when we are designing interventions that we, we need to keep in mind who are the kids who we want to support what are their problems, how severe are the problems. So it's a kind of flexible way of thinking and how, how to adjust uh, the support. And of, of course, this comes from the mindset of responsive to intervention that there were different levels of, of intervention. So this kind of is in line with that thinking as well. Well, those are the kind of a general uh, view uh, kind of um, frameworks in my, my work on our group's work. And then I, I'm starting to go to more detailed uh, description. Uh, we, um, about 15 years ago, uh, we had nice funding from the Ministry of Education and a task that we should make evidence-based uh, tools and produce evidence-based knowledge for teachers about learn, mathematical learning difficulties in age group um, five to eight years old. So for us, it means kindergarten, first and second graders, because our, our kids go to school when they are seven. But what we faced then was that we actually didn't know, or there was no consensus about what are the skills that are developing in this age group? What, what are the most important skills that everyone should have when they proceed from, the, from second grade upwards. And that's why we, we made with my colleague Pekka Rasanen uh, kind of a core and numerical skills model. And our, our kind of aim was to make a an, an model for teachers so that they could be better prepared to, to identify children who have problems and also to help them. So this was kind of knowledge base, what we needed to do everything else. And from here, we have developed assessment tools. From here, we have developed intervention tools. But this is the base of our like, conceptual work. And uh, without going to details here and not explaining the whole model, but uh, I have here marked with the brown or yellow is whatever that is like squares that uh, when now I'm later talking about uh, age group three to five years, then early mathematical logical principles are important. And those are like series and one-to-one -one correspondence, um, uh, comparison and, and, and such skills. And then we have uh, counting skills, which means that the, the kids are able to say the number or segment forward and backwards, and then they can recognize the, the number symbols, and then they can say how many is in a set, so they can use it for, for counting. And then we have uh, also some 
uh, information about symbolic numbers and in our current studies, but so we are not covering all what is here, but this has been quite useful working tool for, for teachers and us when we have um, designed the assessment tools and designed the intervention tools that the teachers use. And this was based on, on existing test batteries and their task in it. So it's a, it's a kind of a review work that is behind it. It seems very simple, but uh, in real life, there was 16 versions of this picture, which were much more complex, but we needed to, to kind of simplify it. And, and so it looks like this. So but this is kind of a summary of what we think that are the core and numerical skills in, in age group five to eight years old. Uh, we use this, uh, this uh, model also when we had another funding from, from the Ministry of Education. And then we got an, a kind of assignment that we needed to make low cost intervention tools for kindergarten first and second graders, which are kind of paper and pencil. So no, not digitalized because at that time, kindergarten didn't have computers for kids. So they needed something not digitalized and, and easy to use and cheap. And so we started to a project called Think Math. Um, and from there, we, we designed evidence-based interventions and tested them a lot in Finland. And then we had a possibility to go to South Africa and, and try it out if our intervention tools were, were able to support South African kids. It was especially interesting because uh, uh, when we designed those Think Math materials, in my, our idea was to make it very cheap, easy to access, and, and the manuals were uh, so uh, simple that um, teachers could use them very easily. So that was one of the so the kind of easy access for the teacher as well. Uh, <clears throat> this South African uh, study we did a couple of years ago, and um, we wanted to test if the Think Math intervention tools were efficient for, for supporting South African first graders. So they were around six, seven years old, but with them, we used Think Math material that we designed for Finnish kindergartners, so younger ones. Or oh, we did a an, an pre-test post-test design with delayed post-test. And we had three groups. We have intervention and low-performing group. Then we had low control group and we had average control group. We tested all of these groups three times. And uh, first time we, we measured early numeracy skills. Then we measured listening comprehension skills, executive function skills. And we had background variables, age, kindergarten attendance, uh, English learner status uh, to check those uh, kind of important uh, or, or being able to control those things. Uh, with immediate post that we measured early numeracy skills as we did in delayed. And we had uh, five intervention weeks, which we have three times 45 minutes uh, lessons for kids in each week. And then between immediate post test and delayed, we have that common three months uh, time for waiting. Um, Think Math, you can actually load for nothing uh, from our websites. Um, it's done, all our materials are done also in English so that, that it could be used in South Africa. We published it uh, in our Think Math website so that everybody who wants can go there and, and load them and use them. And in South Africa, we use mathematical relational accounting skills. And um, uh, it is the most simple uh, intervention package that we have made. And um, this is um, about, there is a lot about comparing quantities and numbers and, and using the concept like more or less and, and that kind of basic, basic comparison um, concepts. 
And then there is this counting number sequence um, and, and counting object and matching them with words and number symbols. Um, it is 15 times three, four, th 35 to 40 minutes in small groups. South Africa, we had four, 46 groups in, in, uh, in one group. Uh, it's con it is done the way that in each session, there is this first teacher-led activities where the teacher is teaching the content, the new content, and then there is pair guided uh, pair activities. So with pairs or with with kids who two or, or three want to play, play, for example, games, and then there is individual activities. So all all lessons follow that structure, and then we used explicit teaching and we used concrete representational and abstract um, materials in supporting kids learning. Uh, and this is actually my dream has been for beginning of, from beginning of my career, which is quite long, <laughs> I think 15 years already, more, almost 20, um, uh, is this one. Uh, blue one is our intervention group. And low control is the, the orange and this gray is average control group. The figure one tells you um, that uh, the results in numerical relational skills and, and why I'm proud of this picture is that this is one of the first studies showing that we have a delayed effect uh, in inter early numeracy in intervention. So we really can think that uh, the learning was, was still there after three months um, after intervention has stopped in a three months time. And this is a statistically significant, those, those differences. Uh, we didn't see the same thing in counting skills. So what we had is the, the most effects or the, the biggest effects were here in numerical relational skills. So meaning that the children learned series and comparison and one-to-one -one correspondence skills. And here is important to know that we controlled for executive functions, language skills, age, the la uh, English language learner status, and kindergarten attendance and gender. And still, there was this effect. So this is uh, one of, of very nice found funding findings in, in our studies. Um, as I said, uh, often it is so that early numeracy uh, interventions do not have sustainable effects. They often fade out. And that's why in our group, we have been thinking that what we, we might need something else there to boost that learning. So what, what that would be. And, and at least in Finland, a couple of years ago, there started to be a lot of concern about that children are less physical active because they are playing the games all the time. So they are not anymore um, playing baseball in, in, in outside and having this kind of active physical life as we thought that we had when we were kids. So uh, there was this kind of public talk that now we should be concerned. At the same time, uh, in physical activity studies uh, from sports sciences, they started to publish papers so showing that uh, physical activity is associated with academic learning. And it was mostly in the end of primary school, me meaning actually kids from 12 to 16 years. And then I started to think that, okay, is it so that physically inactive life is new risk factor also for learning, not only for health, but also for learning. And because then it might be a new booster for learning difficulties. So that's why we, we designed a project for preschoolers for three and five years old, uh, where we would like to um, measure physical activity, motor skills, executive function, and early numbers. Why these? Uh, because the executive functions has been shown to, or guessed, to be the reason why physical activity and math was related in all the kids. 
So we wanted to see if it's there in the beginning of the development as well. We are following two age cohorts born in 2015 and 16. We have three measurement points. Uh, we are in the stage of, of uh, in a half of time point two at the moment. Uh, so uh, we have had problem with COVID as, as several other one, groups as well. And then uh, in addition to our cohort study, we have also implemented an intervention package there because we wanted to kind of uh, speed up the possibility to get results if how these two are related. We have funding from Finnish Cultural Foundation and Finnish Academy of Sciences uh, Sports Council in the end. So it means that it, it's uh, uh, Ministry of Education and Culture Sports Council that gives the money, but the selection process go via Finnish Academy of Sciences. A bit complicated, but anyway. Uh, we have a lot of concepts and what we are going to try to define so that everybody would understand. But uh, mainly the, uh, the light yellow are the main key concepts. So we have from physical activity and motor skills, we think they are, this is based on, on research literature published before, before this year. And so we know that physical activity and motor skill should be related. We also have evidence that physical activity and motor skills affect executive functions. We have knowledge that executive functions is related to language skills and early numeracy skills, but we don't actually know the whole pictures, how these are related to each other and in which phase. And, and how important are they? And this, this is what we are now working on a lot, how to kind of figure out what is the most important. So I'm looking, I'm like hunting, I'm hunting for the most, the biggest predictor of, of, of learning difficulties. I want to know what is the key concept, key issue, why children get uh, more problems than the other ones. It might be several, but anyway. This is our base, basic design. We have a three measurement points for our cohorts. Our, our aim was to get 500 children for the cohort. And from the cohort, we have intervention design, dropping down to control and uh, FMS control and early numeracy group. And FMS, FMS means uh, fundamental motor skills. And then we have there also the immediate post-test and delayed post-test design. But, Unfortunately, I have now to show you uh, first measurement point results, and then I have one results from our pilot intervention because we have not been able to start the intervention because we were not allowed to go and spend so much time in, in kindergartens or preschools uh, do, during the COVID pandemic. So we have a little bit changed this one or actually postpone it. We, we hope to get it done next year. Uh, we have uh, several measurement tools which we are using, mainly, mainly digitalized is the EF measurements uh, uh, and we measure working memory inhibition, switching and flanker with inhibition. And then we have physical activity sensors what the children actually keep uh, on for, for one week. And then we have this very traditional cubes and paper and pencil stuff where we measure, uh, for example, language and, and early numeracy skills. Uh, what we have now is uh, 365 um, children measured and 16 preschools in a metropolitan area. So it, it's quite nice. Even though we have COVID, we have been able to collect this data. So it's, it's a pretty nice thing. Uh, we have physical activity measurement from 229 children, motor skills uh, 301, and I have to move your pictures. Uh, executive function is 210, and uh, early number of skills is 317. Um, fine motor skills I have left and language skills here down because I don't have in our analysis what I will show them. So today, those ones, but they come later on. 
Um, here is one of our papers that is submitted, and I, I show you the results, and hope, I hope you will not tell everybody what our results are because it's not yet published, but maybe it's nice to see what we are having, what we have found so far. Uh, I'm, uh, here we can see, um, so I'm trying to demonstrate with colors what we have found. So the blue one, uh, vigorous physical activity is directly linked to working memory updating skills in, in kids. And locomotor skills, which are running and hopping and skipping, they are related to working memory updating as well, directly. And then we have an, an indirect link from vigorous physical activity. This is running so that you kind of have short of breath and you, your pulse is getting high. So it's quite intensive. That explains, uh, that has an indirect link from um, uh, via locomotor skills, working memory updating to early numeracy. And then the, the brown or yellow, whatever this color is, from stability skills. There is a direct link to early numeracy skills. And then there is uh, an indirect effect via inhibition and switching to early numeracy. And the red one is probably the not nice one. Uh, it is that moderate physical activity. So this is the level of, let's say, walking. So your pulse is not getting high. You are not sweating. Your breath is not, you are not short of breath anyway. So it's, it's kind of moderate activity. And that is negatively linked to working memory updating and inhibition and switching. And it has an indirect link from moderate physical activity via inhibition to early numeracy. So it seems that we have an effect from, from physical activity level and intensity and motor skills to working memory and then to early numeracy. So not physical activity alone, but uh, also skills are important when we think how um, the working memory is affected by, by, by movement of the kids. And then I uh, continue from here is, so we did also a systematic review. So we looked all interventions that had motor skills and physical activity in, and they have cognitive and academic skills as outcome variables. And they were for preschool children. We wanted to see if there is an effect or not. And the main results from here is that we found uh, 39 studies with almost uh, 3,000 children. But only two of these 39 studies demonstrated strong methodological quality. So we, we measured the quality with using epe hopepe measure uh, that kind of protocol to evaluate the, the quality of intervention studies. And this is um, pretty sad, I think. Our intervention studies are quite low quality when we think about kids pre in preschool, and, and having physical activity, motor skills, and cognitive or academic skills and, as outcome. But the they majority of the, of the studies demonstrated, so 70%, demonstrated effects on cognitive and academic skills, and mostly in executive function, language, and numeracy, and, and the biggest effects was on memory. And it seemed that when, when there was so-called combined intervention, meaning that there was physical activity and, and motor skills plus cognitive and academic skills included, that was more efficient than um, fundamental motor skills or physical activity alone. So this kind of cocktail was better than poor whiskey, let's say that. Um, and then if we compared physical activity to motor skills, the physical, uh, the motor skills were more 
effective on, on having, having kind of boost of, of academic skills. So this, um, based on this review, we, we got a support for our pri primary hypothesis for our intervention that yes, we should have an intervention that um, combines um, physical activity, motor skills, and early numeracy skills that might have effect on learning of academic and uh, cognitive factors. So we had uh, a pilot study. Again, this is a paper that is on our desk at the moment, but should be submitted in a month's time. Well, we had um, a combined numerical relation and a motor skills intervention for preschoolers. And this is a pilot study because uh, of COVID, we didn't have all the elements that we, we would have needed, but we wanted to try something so that we were, would be more prepared for the next one. And the, the, the biggest disappointment with this design, at least for me, is that we didn't have a control group because we were not allowed to move between the preschool so much. Uh, so it, it kind of, we need, needed to stay with testing with, with same kindergarten or same preschool. And that's why we, we kind of lost the control group, the real ground control group. But again, I, I, I explain what we did. Uh, we had um, two um, pre-test time points where we tested early numeracy skill, and then we used SIMP, which is the symbolic magnitude processing. Bertha Smith had been talking to you, I think, months or two ago about, I'm, I'm sure that he at least mentioned this test because it's his test. And then we, we measured also uh, fundamental motor skills in time point one and in time point two and time point three and time point four. And our intervention was situated between time point two and three. Uh, it was two times 45 minutes per week and it lasted for, for uh, eight weeks. I mean. And our idea was that with this kind of uh, design we can add try to track the general development and then development during the intervention. Uh, the, the materials look like very common preschool materials, books and, and, and balls and that kind of very simple ones. Um, we actually got the idea of this study from Hassinger Dust study where they used the story books to, to increase the children's um, math language and, and kind of uh, use of rich math language. And that's why we, we took five books in Finnish, which had a lot of mathematical concepts or early numeracy concepts. And we, um, one book was read during three sessions. And then we also had fundamental motor skills exercises which used the same concepts as was in a book. So we kind of wanted to the same, same concepts and then it was in book and it was in, in fundamental motor skills exercises. And again, 45 minutes, two times a week and for eight weeks. And teachers in, in kindergarten did this one. And they had um, an, uh, each session they had this kind of logbook where they were um, reporting how they were following and each week we had a meeting with with the teacher so they could ask if there were problem and we could we talk about the, the issues and we got feedback of the materials so it was very very cooperative way of working uh, this seems very complicated but it's uh, just trying to describe that in each lesson there was this kind of beginning where, where the, the overview of the lesson plan was, was made for, for kids um, and with pictures and probably with a uh, game with a ball throwing it and so kind of warming up. Then there was reading of the book, it took 20 minutes and then there was a movement part 15 minutes. And in reading and movement parts, there were always um, three little bit different sessions per book 
uh, to be able to kind of cover the whole uh, thing um, thoroughly. That was the idea. And then there was this con kind of conclusion where, where concepts were again repeated and exercised, and then they had the relaxing time and, and they were happily returning to their own teaching groups. Uh, we had uh, six, 18 children in, a little bit more girls than boys, 11 girls and seven boys, and they were took, taken from our cohort study. And they were identified by their teachers as having problems with early numeracy language. And this was also, sorry, uh, uh, verified with our, our own test results. So first teacher identified, and then we checked from our results that did we agree that they were low and, and included in a group or were included with the teacher um, suggested. And here are some results. E and total, you can see that they were, they were increasing their skills in all measurement points. Same goes to relational skills, increasing during, during the time of measurements, counting skills as well. Symbolic number was uh, processing not so much, but that was not expected and fundamental models too as well. But I think this is much more interesting. Here we compared um, the gain per month during before intervention and then during intervention. And here we can see that the kids during intervention increase their skills more than before it. So even though the, the sample is very small and we didn't were able to control everything, it's it's kind of support our idea that yes, that we are we are finding some ways to increase the children's skills. They learn what, how we designed the, the lessons. And so we, at least we are thinking it's positive sign and we should continue later on. And actually this is one thing that we will do. And in next phase, uh, we, we use this pilot version. We a little bit make it probably wider, but, but We'll, we'll see how it, it adjust, is adjusted, but basically we go with this program for the next phase of our, our intervention. Uh, so I think I still have a couple of minutes time. Um, as I told you that I'm fascinated about the measurements and I just wanted to share you our quite fresh results. Again, manuscript in process should be submitted in a month time, I hope. Uh, and well, I wanted to, to know that if it's possible to use early numeracy test that is originally done by Johannes van Luyt in, in, in the Netherlands, and I brought it to Finland in 2006 and, and had that standardized here, we, it is quite widely used with uh, Finnish kids who are, who are uh, age group five to two seven and a half years old, it has not been used in this age group. And I was a little bit uncertain that, okay, can we use it? Should we use it? But that was the only one kind of available that we, we thought that, okay, we use it. And it has items that we thought that it's possible to, to do even for a younger age group. And here we have uh, for one, 147 uh, three years old and 173 four years old. And as a result, we see that in three years old age group, it's not possible to use that counting scale. Counting skills measured in, in early numeracy tests are, are using a number word sequence and saying how many is in a set and, and solving that kind of very simple uh, numerical problems. That's not uh, suitable for three years old. Uh, for three years old, we got only scale working that is numerical relational skills that are those uh, seriation and comparison and one-to-one and -one correspondence skills. That worked well. So that can be used to identify problems in, in three years old, but not, not, not the, the numerical scale. But on four years old, both worked. So numerical relational skills 
and uh, counting skill scale. And they both had a uh, nice uh, correlation with SUM, so symbolic magnitude processing skills and language skills, showing a convergent validity. So it, it works like it should be. And it was same in three years old for relational skills and four years old for, for numerical and relational skills. So based on these results, we are quite confident that we can use the early numeracy set test also for younger kids, but not, not for three years old, we can only measure the relational skills, not, not the counting skills. They are too difficult for that. So what's coming up in near future? Oh, we, are, we are heading for our longitudinal data analysis, which where we have physical activity, we measure with, actually we measure with two tools. We have active out on top of the active graph, where we, uh, one of the tasks is to find out if the, the, the levels of, of intensity uh, cutoffs are, are right ones. So with active ball, it's a little bit more sensitive on sedentary behavior. And that's why we want to make a study where we, we check that they work, how they work and what would be the best way to use the results with this age group. And that's one of the issues like measurement stuff that we have to do. Then we have motor skills, fine motor skills, executive functions, early numbers, and SIMP, language skills, and says variables that we still can measure and will come up with the results. And then we have the, the, the movement and early numbers intervention with control proofs where we have simple early numbers, simple movement, and then we have business as usual group. And then we will have the group that have combined movement and early numbers, and then we'll see how it works. We have possibility to use EEG measurements of, of, on top of the other measurements to find out if there is effects of our intervention. Uh, so to sum up a little bit, yes, it seems that it's possible to have intervention tools that help really children to learn basic skills in math in early age. That's what our think material I think math material showed in, uh, in South Africa and our newest studies with the physical activity and motor skills have shown that it's linked to EF and EN performance, but we don't know yet how important they are. We don't know yet uh, the, the developmental dynamics, so that's what we have to look for. And we don't know yet what is the extra impact of early numeracy intervention when we put their physical activity or motor skills. What's the extra what we get from that? Um, uh, there will be bigger things here, as, like behind is this new methodology. We'll have better possibilities to investigate young children's behavior. We get with physical activity measurements, we get objective data, how, how, they, how intensive they, they are moving, and how much they are moving. But it's, uh, it's increasing <laughs> number of data, what needs to be kind of handled. But it, it will open new possibilities, as well as the digitalized measurement, for example, in EF, where we can get, get the reaction time and we can get, get the, the, the accuracy and several other things. Uh, but we have to know now how to use them with small kids and how to apply what we know. And then it will change our way to think about dynamics between skills because we get more objective data because this data has often been observable, observational data from adult perspective. So it cannot be so detailed as, as the, the sensor data is. Um, but then a uh, bigger thing is that uh, when we start to use this new technology in our, our measurement, the big data starts to develop. And I'm not all every day sure that we are really ready for the analysis as, as a special educators uh, from, from that science field. 
and because from with that comes the open accessness of the data because if you collect big data you should open it it should be for everybody because otherwise it's usefulness it's stupid to use a lot of money to get one data and then don't open it because it, it's it's just stupid um, and in the end it should benefit the children and at least in Finland we don't have protocols how we do that. So how that big data that we collect from children's performance comes and benefits the children and they learn. So I think that's one of the, those kind of bigger challenges that we face in our, our field of science. So I think this is it. I thank you and I hope that you have some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pirjo Yin. Yes, there are already a number of questions uh, in the chat box. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pick out a few of them. Um, I think, first of all, a couple of clarifications. So uh, one is from uh, Vic Sims around, you know, how did you specify the components to build think mats? Uh, was it based upon previous components from other interventions or from correlational studies? I don't know whether you could give a bit more information there. Uh, well, this uh, think math was was based on 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 research before published before, so that's why we had this explicit teaching came from from the current reviews, and then this uh, concrete representational and abstract division came from from research, and then this kind of a teacher, um, uh, the teacher is teaching first, then they practice together, and then they do it individually also came from the research. So basically all the components came from, from the research that we knew then it, what are effective. And it seems that they are quite the same as was in the current, uh, or was it this week or last week, one of your publications. So it seems quite similar. And there's a question from Declan around um, the pen and paper task versus uh, individual one-to-one -one testing, because I think the pen and paper, were they done by teachers in the classroom or also? Uh, no, no, the, they are one that, okay, I, our concept is wrong. It's they are the ones that teacher does with the kid, but they use, uh, for example, cubes or they have paper where the children can draw, but it's always one-to-one, -one, one testing situation. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Our children cannot do it in group when they are three and four years. I don't know if your kids can do it. <laughs> no, no, they can't. And I think this was the question around, you know, indeed, how do you know how they solve it if yeah. they're doing it in group? But obviously that wasn't yeah. necessarily the case. Uh, there's another study, a, a, a um, question, sorry, from uh, Erica around some clarification in terms of um, what criteria you used for uh, the children with numerical numeracy difficulties and whether you found any gender differences so it, so um in the ones who were showing poor numeracy skills so whether there was a bias there or not uh, what was the first question um what criteria you used for children with uh, numeracy numer numerical difficulties or uh, it must be the, uh, the South African study. Uh, there we have the cutoff point in, in 20th percentile. So we just took it from there. And then the other question was... Around whether there were any gender differences, whether you found a bias towards one gender or another or not. Yeah, this is interesting because this almost always is asked the same question. And I, <laughs> I always have to kind of answer the same way that there is not no consistent gender differences in this age group uh, in like cross the measurement ways so it, it seems that at least i have because i have been looking at this many years because every time it's asked and i, I always check it but like there is no consistent um, way that counting skills is always in every country of the world in all measurements better in girls that's not true it, it, they they change and I, I i tend to think that there is no gender differences in real life in this age group it also yeah i was going to say there's also differences between age you see them yes sometimes yes. you compare to early yes. it might be yeah. too early to see them already yeah, yeah but in early numeracy i haven't seen consistent gender differences 
There's also a question uh, from Beverly around what, um, but I think it was before you explained some of your executive functioning task, but also around, um, there was also a question around what language measure you used. Um, so I don't know whether you want to say anything more around your executive functioning tasks or your, uh, that was around for the South African study and the language measure was for your newest study on the, the longitudinal. Yeah, okay. So the, the EF, EF measurement for, for the South African study was flanker. So, okay. so it was fish going to, to, to uh, children are going to feed the fish and, and, and push the button with which, which direction is going. Okay. And uh, the, what was the second one? Well, that's okay. I know it's very late in Finland now. It's, good. it's almost seven o'clock, so you know we forget for that. And um, it's my uh, working memory is totally low. So yeah. <laughs> that's all right. So the question was around uh, you measured around um, language. Uh, yeah. I think uh, for for your the, the new longitudinal study, and the question was what measure did you use there for language? Uh, they are listening comprehension task mostly. So in in a sense that we 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 measure children's understanding of concepts and and. We give them kind of commands and see what they do. So very simple way of of seeing if they understand key concepts or most important fundamental concepts in language. Um, I've got a question for you, if you don't mind. So, um, are you measuring any visuospatial abilities in your motor, in you know, this motor intervention, early numeracy intervention that you're doing? No, we had it uh, in a list uh, that should we should we do it, uh, and then uh, we have some tasks inside um, fine motor skills, which kind of could be used, but but not not that well that I could say that we still have. Because I was wondering whether you think that the relationship between motor and number development is direct, or whether it would go indirectly not only via executive functioning but also indirectly maybe via visuospatial abilities which goes back to this theory around maybe it's children's number line or understanding mm. of how numbers relate to each other which has a visuospatial aspect to it so it did. yeah i think that that should be like looked more carefully i don't have answer for that one okay i don't know whether you've got like a task that is more around how numbers are aligned to each other, whether that could already give some insight. No, we don't have it uh, with this. You know, the problem is, you know, when you're testing young children, you can't always assess them on everything, right? The batteries become too big then to really... Yeah, it, it would have been, we had like double the list that we would like to measure, but then we needed, we have in Finland quite strict this kind of research permits from the city and we have to... Um, argue for each variable that we we measure so it's it's quite tough so that kind of help you to <laughs> decrease your list <laughs> feel like your wish list and then your christmas list yeah. the real it. list is like this and then your wish list is much bigger <laughs> that makes sense it will be interesting to see what you find i've got one more question um from uh, vic again from vic sims around you know um whether you know anything around the ENT and whether it's got predictive validity for the age of three, and so whether it predicts any later maths difficulties. What was the what was the variable? Do you know, you... it's just in general. Do you know of any studies that show a predictive validity uh, for the ENT for maths difficulties? It was more around your um, your task that you brought to Finland. Um, you know, I was curious of whether you'd be able to follow those children up because you were able to say that the kids were able to perform on a subcomponent of the task. And it'd be really interesting to see if that has predictive validity. Sorry, Joe, I didn't really write that very well. <laughs> as soon as I read it, I realized I hadn't written it well. But it's great that you came in, Vic, so you could clarify it. <laughs> well, uh... I have studied a lot with, I have done several studies with, with early numeracy tests because that was the one that I, I brought into Finland and that was the only one uh, for a long time that we could use. And we have used it in, um, in several other countries, but yes, it, it um, 2010 we published a paper in individual different, learning and individual differences with, uh, with Marko Niemi-Virta where we show that yes, the, the, the ENT before school predicts well the first grade performance. So it, it seems to be catching something uh, like core skills for learning those 
and we we see it also in our other measures which are similar we can kind of take out their sub, same subcomponents also there we see that these two have quite nice predictive value for for later learning thank you that's great thanks that is great Pierre. um i don't know whether there's any more last question anyone wants to ask but you know i think it's fascinating you know these this, I would be very interested in hearing your results around the motor intervention and the early number intervention and whether together there's a stronger effect. And uh, yeah, I'm going to keep thinking around it because I'm trying <laughs> to think around what drives the stronger effect and is it as simple as motivation or, but then they're not, you didn't combine them, they're still separate interventions. So yeah. it'd be interesting to see. But I, I would from what I know now, from the data, what we have now and how we have analyzed it from different angles, I think it's something to do with uh, being active uh, and having possibilities to learn different things. So kind of input to your brain is quite wide and, and there is a lot of it. Right. So that's, I think, makes it quite interesting. Really, are we really able to pinpoint some this is it but is it is it this kind of idiotic general answer that everything matters if you practice so this would be interesting in your eeg findings then to see how how that will come out in yes. terms of what uh, what what effect you'll get yes i hope that covid goes away fast and we can go to the, to the preschools and make them so we are all long looking forward to it that we Absolutely. really can make it well, thank you again, Peter, for a fascinating talk, for all the work on early maths that you do. Um, you know, your work inspires me and I'm sure other people as well. So again, thank you very much. Thank you all for those who've been uh, listening and attending today's talk. And we'll be back next week at the usual time and place. So take care and see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> good night. Good night to you. <laughs> thank you.